think <laughs> we all we all ideally would like to surround ourselves with people who agree with us, but of course the danger occurs when we're in a position to make decisions affecting the lives of thousands or millions of people. In George Bush's case, it's an administration that has carried groupthink to staggering new heights where loyalty is rewarded, but not creativity or dissent. Great leaders understand the importance of permitting dissenters to speak, um, of gathering all information about a problem before you make a decision, of being as open as you can to all possibilities and gathering information about all possibilities before making a decision. Uh, in the same way, before you buy a car, you're cho choosing between two cars, you will find out everything you can about both of those cars. After you've chosen one, you will stop reading information about the car that got away. That is why it is really crucial, whether it's in science or politics or business or in our private lives, to make sure we have people around us who will tell us if we're about to really screw up. It's not easy, but once people appreciate how important it is to get those dissenting opinions because they improve the quality of our own decisions, the better off we all are. Now, in science, the whole point of science is to force the scientist to hold up his or her beliefs for empirical examination hold them up, and see if they fly. Uh, the great psychologist Robert Abelson once told a graduate student who was struggling, and so he, this student would not let his hypothesis go. He kept working on it and working on it and doing studies, and all of them were failing, and he wouldn't let it go. And finally, Abelson, Abelson said to him, um, are you going to finally admit what's wrong with your hypothesis, or are you going to go into print and let everyone else tell you? <laughs> and that's the goal. That's the goal in science, to be able to test our ideas and let them go if they aren't supported. And you don't have to be a scientist to think scientifically. You can be anybody who understands how exciting and exhilarating it can be to let go of a bad idea for a better idea. So self-deception, you're saying that it's not the case that it can only be corrected by the self. Uh, by the person deceiving himself, but by the people around him or her. Is there any way of piercing through it from the outside if you're not in that circle? We just mentioned President Bush and the war in Iraq. We were talking about those other issues. Um, regarding the war in Iraq, uh, the Iraqis didn't greet us in the streets with flowers. There were no WMDs. Oil revenues didn't pay for the war like was uh, suggested they would. Uh, the mission wasn't accomplished, as Bush said it was, You know when he was on that carrier. So even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, people firmly stick to their uh, deeply held beliefs. Here's the question. How do you get through to people, maybe our possibly self-deceived leaders, if you're not part of their inner circle that might even be able to puncture through uh, certain beliefs with dissent? All right. You've just asked the crucial question. How do we puncture the protective cocoon of self-justification? And the answer is, most of the time, we will not be able to, especially when the self-justifying person has so much invested in a course of action, especially when that course of action has caused enormous harm, difficulty, and trouble to him or herself or to everybody around the person. Um, the more a person has invested in a course of action, the harder it's going to be to break that cocoon of self-justification, um, precisely because it's such a devastating realization to a person to realize, I just did something in my medical practice that caused the death of my patient. I, as President of the United States, made one of the most disastrous military decisions in our nation's history, causing the deaths of thousands and thousands of people and upwards of a trillion dollars. What's predictable about George Bush, as we predicted last year, actually one political scientist said, if Bush were a rational politician, he will realize he's lost the country's support for the war, and therefore he will 
change direction because otherwise they'll lose both houses of Congress and what rational politician will risk doing that? And the answer is, of course, not a rational one, but a rationalizing one. And so students of self-justification, like Elliot Aronson and myself, predicted that Bush would do just what he did, more of the same. That's self-justification in action. What do the rest of us do about it? Well, the rest of us do just what the country is beginning to do, which is to uh, speak out against the war, hope that our opposing politicians, and more important, Republican politicians, will start standing up on their hind legs and forcing this president and this administration to follow the law, to follow um, the dictates of Congress in the progress of war, of thinking of alternatives and of ways of getting out. And while certainly this conversation has begun, when you have a leader who is as self-justifying as this one, the dissent has to come primarily from his own party, if he's going to be influenced at all, really, or by a majority uh, of the opposing party. If he could be influenced at all. That's right. He is not going to change. He is too far in, and he is not enough of a statesman or a leader to say, I was wrong. Um, we're not going to hear that from him. And it's interesting, you know, politicians left, right, and center have been writing speeches for Bush. You know, I was wrong. I made a mistake. He's not listening. We don't often get into politics on the show, uh, at least electoral politics are talking about it in the way that we just were, but I appreciate you touching on it given your background as a social scientist and this conversation about self-deception. Well, what an object lesson our current administration. It is, but keep in mind, it's not just about Republicans or Democrats. It is about self-justification. There have been plenty of democratic self-justifying presidents. Mm. You know, we happen to be talking about this one who's a Republican and who in my view, in many people's views, has done a, made disastrous decisions in this country. But um, the mechanism of self-justification is not limited to Republicans. You're saying, it. in fact, it's universal. It's not even just an American thing. It's kind of a species thing, male, female, uh, you know, just everywhere. All of us uh, engage in it. In that context, let's talk about religious and paranormal beliefs, since we touch on those subjects on the show quite a bit. Let's talk about their connection with cognitive dissonance or dissonance theory, whatever it's called. These days, it seems like atheism is all the rage with these big-time best-selling books out there by scientists and public intellectuals writing against religion religious beliefs. Uh, do you think that the fact that religious people um, increasingly, I mean, there are sections of the religious, there are groups of the religious who don't demand proof for their beliefs, do you think this is a way of alleviating their cognitive dissonance? The same could be asked about those who believe strongly in unsupportable beliefs in the paranormal, like UFOs or faith healing, Bigfoot, ghosts, etc. They're kind of just believing because they believe. <laughs> yes. Well, look, the more important a particular belief is to us, the more strongly we will ignore or reject evidence suggesting that we're wrong. Okay. So what are the most central beliefs that people hold? Their religious beliefs, their political beliefs. Certainly many scientists have held beliefs deeply that have taken a few hundred years to overturn, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not that scientists always think scientifically either. But religion is the big one, of course, because religion is central to many people's feeling of what gives them meaning and purpose in life. When you have a belief that is that central to your needs, you are going to defend it at all costs. All people of all religions. Now, to me as a social scientist, what's interesting is how people reduce the dissonance between my religion says this, but now how do I deal with that? Okay. So uh, evolution is a good example. Most religious people believe in evolution and feel no discrepancy, no dissonance between Darwin and their religious views. And, of course, other fundamentalist Christians 